This week, the world tuned in to watch the debate between the two candidates for what is surely the most powerful democratically elected public office in the world, President of the United States. A contest for power. But where does real power lie? What can change the world? What can change human hearts? What can change the future and eternity? Is there a power like that? From the first chapter of the Bible to the last, the answer of scripture is that the power that drives the universe is the word of God. God speaks and from nothing creates everything. God speaks and kingdoms rise and fall. God speaks and the dead are raised. The prophets of the Bible are the heralds of what God is doing by his word. Jonah, the prophet of Israel, is one such messenger in the 8th century BC when Assyria was the regional superpower. But in an extraordinary twist, Jonah, the herald of God's powerful word, abandons his calling. Jonah is the reluctant prophet. God gives him a mission to go to a pagan nation, the enemy of his own nation, and preach to them. But in chapter one, he boards a ship and flees from his commission. But God cannot be escaped. And when Jonah is tossed into the sea, God sends a great fish who saves Jonah from a watery death and vomits him out on land again. And so God renews Jonah's mission. Chapter three, verse two tells us, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. This morning, I wanna think about the word of grace, the word of judgment, and the word of repentance. Firstly, a word of grace, verses one to three. The second half of the book of Jonah opens in almost exactly the same way as it began. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. God is a God of second chances. In chapter one, we're told the Lord said, arise and go, but Jonah rose and fled. Now the Lord says, arise and go. And verse three says, Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. In chapter one, we're told Jonah fled away from the presence of the Lord. But now we're told he went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. When the Lord commissions Jonah again, it is a word of grace from the God of second chances. When Jesus is arrested, Peter denies him three times. But when Jesus is resurrected, Peter is restored and commissioned as his servant. Saul is on his way to Damascus with papers for the arrest and execution of the Christians. When he's met by the risen Lord Jesus and commissioned Paul, apostle to the Gentiles. Charles Colson was special counsel to President Richard Nixon 50 years ago and was imprisoned for his part in the Watergate affair that led to the collapse of the Nixon presidency. One night in 1973, he found himself sitting in his car, overcome with grief. He wrote, this so-called White House hatchet man, ex-Marine captain, was crying too hard to get the keys into the ignition. I sat there for a long time that night, deeply convicted of my own sin. He trusted in Christ, pled guilty at his trial, and after his release from prison, established prison fellowship, which became a global ministry to prisoners. But Chuck Colson's story is every Christian's story. You can make a start with God, whoever you are, and in whatever situation you find yourself, the God who made the dry land and the sea, the God who made everything, and to whom everyone will give account for their life, hates nothing that he has made and will welcome us despite our failings and foolishness. You can make a start with God and you can get things wrong and start again. Every Christian knows that we do not start with Christ and we do not walk with Christ on the basis of our performance, but only on the basis of his grace and compassion. Jesus has borne in his body the due punishment of our sin so that there is a limitless supply of grace and forgiveness to start again, again and again, and the help of his spirit to make us like him. When the word of the Lord comes to Jonah again, it's a word of grace from the God of second chances. Second, the word of judgment. 
Nineveh was one of three royal cities in the Assyrian Empire. It was not the largest of them, although we're told it was exceedingly great and three days journey in breadth. Uh, the phrase three days breadth is probably not a literal description. The archeological record suggests Nineveh was a diplomatic hub of emissaries and ambassadors. It was a city where diplomatic protocols might occupy three days. But three times in the book, Nineveh is called a great city. And every time it's God who identifies Nineveh in that way. In chapter four, the Lord contrasts Jonah's concern for the plant with his lack of concern for the city. In other words, this is not the largest city. It's certainly not a good city. It's home to one of the most violent and cruel dynasties the world has ever known, but it is great in importance to God. It matters to God. As chapter four said, God cares not only about the people in the city, but also the animals. Sydney today is a city of five million or more people. No one would say it was a city marked by its devotion to the Lord, although it is a city of devotees to many gods and lords. Not only people of many faiths, but people of many gods, wealth and comfort and image and self. Like Nineveh, many modern global megacities are swollen with pride in their own achievements, fame and power, and many are scornful of God, seeking even to silence faith, to confine religion to the home or church, to the inner realm of beliefs that are not permitted to be aired in polite company. Uh, coverage recently of the newest nominee to the US Supreme Court, Amy Coney Barrett, has been accompanied by reports of concern about her deep religious faith, as though those who do not worship God have no deeply religious faith. But as a friend of mine posted this week, if you want to see dogma, head over to Twitter. It's not that religion has no place in the modern public square. It's that the God of the Bible is excluded from the square because the gods of our age will not have him. But God cares for cities and those who live in them. It would be so easy to be careless of our neighbors who do not know the love of God and do not fear the coming judgment. It would be easy, but it wouldn't be like God. He cares. God cares about the city and he cares about the evil in the city. The message that Jonah is given is stark and confronting. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown overthrown. It's a message of judgment. The consistent teaching of the whole Bible is that the God of Israel is not Israel's God. The God of Israel is the God of the nations, and all nations will account to him. In chapter one, he's called the God of heaven, who made the dry land and the sea. That's a way of saying that God is over and outside and above the earth, and the maker and owner and judge of all the earth. Exodus 34 tells us that the God who is called gracious and compassionate and slow to anger, yet will not leave the guilty unpunished. The evil in the world makes even morally compromised humans like us cry out for justice, though we are implicated in so much injustice ourselves. Movements against modern slavery, racism, poverty, movements in defense of dissent freedom, the rights of oppressed ethnic minorities and the poor are cries for justice against exploitation, tyranny and brute power. A God who knows no judgment, a God who doesn't care about justice and the punishment of evil, a God who is just a distant and abstract notion of love, a kind of self-serving wish, is neither the God of the Bible nor a God worth worshipping. But if the God who made all things and cares about all things also judges all things, then the invitation to know him, to know his love, to trust in his justice and to know his mercy is a message of genuine hope and a message that gives all of our ordinary daily experience significance and weight. Jonah preaches to Nineveh, inviting them to flee the coming wrath it was a simple, stark and confronting message and the Ninevites had no difficulty in understanding it. 
in God's mercy, they not only heard it, they believed. They believed that this Hebrew preacher from out of town was in fact the messenger of the God of all the earth. They believed. God's mercy contained in the word of coming judgment. Well, thirdly, let's think about the response to Jonah's preaching. Thirdly, the word produces repentance. In verse 5, we're told that the people of Nineveh believed God, called for a fast, and dressed in sackcloth. They mourned, they grieved in recognition and rejection of their sin. Denying their appetite and laying themselves bare were ways of expressing their grief, their rejection of their old ways, their turning from sin. And it was comprehensive from the least to the greatest. In verse 6, we're told that the word reaches the king. Maybe he heard Jonah preach himself. Maybe he heard about Jonah from others. Whatever it was, his response is the same as his people. He removes his royal robes and dresses in robes of mourning. He descends from his throne and sits in ashes, acknowledging his dependence and limitation. The king is neither immortal nor above judgment. Now, this in fact is a picture of the process for every person who comes to Christ. No one can be a follower of Jesus and remain on their own throne. We must all descend and allow him to ascend to the throne of our lives. But in the mathematics of the gospel, this is to find freedom, not lose it. This is to gain the world, not lose it. This is to save your soul, not lose it. For Jesus lifts up the humble and exalts the lowly and the brokenhearted. The poor in spirit, says Jesus, will inherit the kingdom. The essence of what happens in response to Jonah's preaching is turning, or the theological word, repentance. Verse 8, let everyone turn from his evil way and the violence that is in his hands, says the king. Verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. What is called for in response to the preaching of the gospel is turning, repentance. Jesus comes preaching and says, repent and believe the good news for the kingdom of God is at hand. The apostle Paul says to the Thessalonians, they tell how you turned from idols. The word that Jonah preached, the gospel that is preached today is a giant sign on the road saying, wrong way, go back. We've set ourselves on our own path, but it leads to death. To get onto the road with Jesus, we need to turn around. We need a second chance. We need a change of heart. We need a change of loyalty. We need a clear vision of the darkness that lurks in our own hearts, our defiance and rejection of God. And we need a fresh vision of the grace and beauty and majesty and saving truth and radiant love and glorious cross work of the Lord Jesus in his gospel. We need to come down off the throne of our own lives and allow Jesus to ascend to his rightful place. In the service of baptism for new believers, the first question that must be answered is, do you turn to Christ? Do you turn to Jesus as savior who washes away your sin? Do you turn to Jesus as Lord who commands your life? Do you turn to Jesus as your rescuer from the judgment to come, as your master in every moment, every relationship, every decision? Do you turn to Jesus as the one who is your food, your drink, your wisdom, your wealth, your hope and life? A word of grace, a word of judgment, a word of repentance, and lastly, a word to the church. At the same time that Jonah was preaching to Nineveh, Amos was preaching to Israel. Amos chapter 2 says, They sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground. They deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. 
They lie down on garments taken in pledge, and they drink wine taken as fines. God's people Israel are guilty of injustice and wickedness and immorality just as much as pagan Nineveh. God sends to Israel a prophet warning of the judgment to come at the same time that he sends Jonah to pagan Nineveh. Nineveh repents, for a time at least, but Israel do not. Nineveh repents from the greatest to the least, but in Israel only a remnant, a small number, are found faithful. In Nineveh, they humbly and urgently call out to God. Who knows, the king says, perhaps God will relent. But in Israel, they presume upon God and take refuge in their empty rituals. In Amos chapter 4, the Lord says scathingly, bring your sacrifices every morning, brag about your offerings, boast about them, you Israelites, for this is what you love to do. Jonah the prophet is outraged by God's grace extended to the Ninevites, who were godless and undeserving. But the message of the book of Jonah to the people of God, then and now, is this. Have we repented? If Israel is guilty of the same sins as Nineveh, then Israel must repent. And if the church is as guilty as the world, then the church must repent. We are rather good at identifying the sins of the world for which the world will be judged. But is the church guilty of the same sins? Greed and neglect of the poor. Indifference to the injustice that touches others but not us. Selfish preoccupation with our own ambitions, pleasure and fulfilment. Proud self-satisfaction. Rank sexual immorality. Why does the Bible contain a story of the comprehensive, if temporary, repentance of a pagan people? If not to say to the people of God, have you repented? The Thessalonian church provide the model, they turned from idols and they turned to the living and true God to serve him and to wait for his son Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. The first baptism question is, do you turn to Christ? But it is not only a question for those to be baptized, it is a question for every Christian, every day, in every context. Do you turn to Christ? The word that changes the world, the word that raises the dead, the word that changes eternity, the word of the gospel to everyone under heaven. Turn to Christ and live.